my afternoon. Is this working? Yes, it is my great pleasure to introduce our friend who uh, a recent addition to our department. We're very happy to say who, uh, along with Shusha Chen and Simon Donaldson, recently proved a wonderful result in geometry. And I think we'll hear about that. The uh, title of his talk is Scalarized on Metrics from a House Off Limits and Algorithmic Geometry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you help me? Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this room. And uh, <laughs> thank you for, for wiping the board. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to uh, recall what is Kähler Einstein matrix. So these are just the uh, remaining Einstein metrics. So if I reach is lambda g, where lambda is a constant. So this Einstein equation, we study this Einstein equation on Kähler manifolds. So we assume it's a xj is a complex manifold, compact. And uh, we assume this is metric G is uh, compatible with the complex structure J. So this equation will be made easier by considering the associated Kähler form. So this is uh, just a rotation of the metric G by this complex structure J. And this Kähler form locally is decided by one function, i d d bar of a function phi. This is a locally. So this m makes things much easier because uh, now we are only need to deal with a uh, potential function. And uh, similarly, the Ricci curvature tensor can be also rotated. We get a Ricci form. So in Riemannian geometry, this, uh, the Ricci curvature can be understood in terms of normal coordinates. So it's uh, the second derivative of the volume form in normal coordinates. And in the Kähler setting, so this uh, turns out also to be, to have a nice expression as the second derivative of the volume form. Because we are in a complex setting, the volume form is given by determinant of Hessian of this uh, function. So everything is uh, simpler in the Kähler setting. Moreover, this, uh, because uh, from the, this definition, this uh, Ricci form is always uh, closed. So it uh, determines a cohomology class. And uh, this cohomology class uh, is known to be the first chain class uh, of x uh, j multiplied by 2 pi. So already from the expression, we see that uh, there is a necessary condition for a compact complex manifold to admit uh, this k line symmetric is that if a Ricci form is proportional to omega, then this first chain class must be proportional to the cohomology class of uh, omega, which is a uh, Kähler. So this is the famous Calabi conjecture. That, uh, so given this data xj, so xj admits a Kähler Einstein metric. So I will just abbreviate uh, admits Kähler Einstein. If and only if uh, this uh, co complex geometric conditions, the first chain class is uh, proportional to a Kähler class. So lambda is constant, <coughs> and omega is Kähler. So, 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 so the one direction is uh, just what I just said. And uh, the other direction turns out to be much more challenging. So I will just briefly review. So when, 
So suppose uh, this condition is satisfied, then the depending on the sign of lambda, we have different answers. So when lambda is uh, less than zero, it was proved by Obain and Yao. And uh, when lambda equals zero, this is proved by Yao. At both, uh, in both cases, this conjecture holds. So namely, if we have uh, such a numerical condition, then this um, manifold meets the k-line symmetric. And uh, the remaining cases when lambda is positive. So this, uh, so I should say that in, you can think of this, uh, this lambda, the sign of the lambda in one dimension as the sign of the Euler characteristic of the Riemann surface. So this corresponds to high genus Riemann surface. This corresponds to flat case. And uh, this case, uh, in one dimension, we only have one. That's the sphere. In higher dimension, this, these are called funnel manifolds. And actually, there are not so many of them in each dimension. And I will talk about more later in, one, in two dimensions. But the, the, the theorem, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Chen and Donaldson. And it's known as a conjecture going back to Yao. Conjecture that uh, this uh, <coughs> this is, so this this is true if uh, x is uh, is k stable. So it's not always true. This is known long time ago. And uh, then so motiv motivated by this uh, Donaldson Wollenbeck Yao theorem in for homomorphic vector bundles. So Yao conjectured that there, there should be some stability condition for this uh, K line symmetrics. And uh, it turns out this K stability condition defined by Ken and Donaldson was the correct uh, notion. So it's also known that uh, if uh, so this is a necessary condition. If we have a K-line symmetry, then it must be K-stable. This was uh, known before. So, so today I'm not going to define what is K-stability, nor will I talk about the proof of this theorem. I think in last year's Geometry Festival, Professor Donaldson already talked about this. So I will just uh, briefly mention this, uh, this, this is a naive analog of this theorem. It's, uh, for, it is it's, it's very easy. So if, if f is a strictly convex function, on R, and then we, we ask uh, when can, can we find a critical point of this function? But the, the, the graph of f looks quite simple. It's either this picture or this picture, or it could be something like this. So in this case, it has a critical point. In, in this case, it somehow it, 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 it does not have a critical point. In finite time, somehow it goes to infinity. But the value at infinity is bounded. Somehow you can think of there should be some critical point at the infinity. And in this setting, it, it, it does not have a critical point at all. The slope stays away from zero. So, but that, then it's easy to say that uh, this f admits a critical point. If it has a critical point, it must be unique in this case. If and only if uh, the slope at infinity of f is positive. So if you go along either directions, 
the you can the derivative of this function has a limit at infinity. So, so in order to have a critical point, it must grow at infinity. So it must have positive slope at infinity. And uh, so the relation with this theorem is that the existence of k-line symmetric can be think of as a, a critical point of a function, convex function, on the infinite dimensional space. And uh, this case, the stability notion simply mirrors this. Uh, the slope at infinity of this function, you want it to be positive. This, there's a so-called Futaki invariant where you need it to be positive along any direction. OK, so, so this is about the, the, the this, uh, existence of K-Einstein metrics. But, so what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is uh, the relation with uh, moduli spaces of uh, complex manifolds. So the, the, this is, is related, some of the techniques are related to the proof of the theorem. So, so I'm going to talk about the moduli spaces. So, <coughs> Well, when there is a, such a metric, then one would like to collect all these metrics together. So if it, you want to take a set of all x, a fixed dimension, so you want to take all these uh, compact complex manifold, uh, Miss K line symmetric, which omega equals lambda omega. And we normalize lambda to be inside one minus 1 or 0, you can always normalize the metric. And um, we, we also assume this, 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 this um, metrics, uh, kind of metrics are algebraic. So we assume this uh, metric as the curvature of some permission metric on an ample line bundle. And we fix other numerical constants. For example, we, we fix the, the volume. So we fix a V in fix V in a positive integer. So we consider this connection for all these uh, metrics, and we modular the equivalence relation isomorphisms. And, uh, we want to use this uh, to study the modular space of the, the, the manifold themselves. So we forget about the metric. So x, n, j, l. Where n must be. And l is positive. C, l positive. This is called polarized. Com complex manifolds, modular biholomorphisms. So this is L. I mean, when when lambda is not zero, this L is determined by by the by the complex structure itself, just the canonical and anti-canonical line bundles. And when when lambda is zero, one has to cho choose this uh, L. So somehow, so this is uh, compatible with uh, Calabi's original motivation. So he wants to indulge this uh, compact complex manifold with a unique uh, it's canonical metric. And use, use this canonical metric, we can represent the, the manifold. So the, the main point is that uh, in order for this to work, we need, uh, we need this. Uh, metrics to be uniquely determined by, so by this uh, manifold. 
So the main point is the uniqueness. So given this data, x, j, l, <coughs> we, want, uh, we don't want too many of this omega to be Kahle Einstein. So, and this, is, this was known so due, to, due to Calabi in the case when c1 is 0, lambda is 0, lambda is negative. And this was known due to Bandu Mabuchi. Lambda is positive. So when I say unique, so in this case of lambda positive, the uniqueness actually is in a generalized sense because if we have a final manifold, we have S2, we have projective transformations of CP1, and then we can simply pull back this metric by the automorphisms. And then this omega will change. So this, uh, this uniqueness is up to biholomorphism. So given this data x, j, l, that's a unique uh, omega. Sorry. If there is such a omega which is K-Einstein satisfy this condition, then it's unique up to biholomorphic transformations of, of this xj. But that's, that's, all right. that's enough for our purpose, because we, anyway, we allow take isomorphism classes. So why would this work? In, Let's consider the case when dimension is 1. In this case, well, there are three cases when it's depending on the sign of lambda. So if, a, if a lambda is uh, positive, then we, we, are, we are not going to have any moduli. We only have a unique uh, Riemann surface, so this is CP1. <coughs> but when lambda is uh, negative, <coughs> so this fix this volume is the same as fixing the curvature. So we are considered constant minus one curvature metric hyperbolic Riemann surfaces. So, so every we know that every higher genus Riemann surface can be represented by a unique metric with a curvature minus one, and this uh, actually so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these uh, metrics and these. Uh, Complex, complex manifolds. But now, you, if we want to study the compactification of this moduli space, these, these things are usually not compact. So we, w we would like to know the degenerations of these uh, metrics or these manifolds. And uh, the point is that uh, we can use this to use metrics to study the degenerations. And uh, also, it has uh, relations with uh, this algebraic geometry. So, so because of this hyperbolic metrics are, are just rigid, so the only possible way for these to degenerate is when, when they form long and long necks. And in the end, it develops cusp singularity. So th these are the things that we need to consider in the, if we want to compactify the moduli space. And interestingly, in algebraic geometry, there's also 
but in this case, there is also a way of uh, compactifying this uh, moduli space. This is called the Deline Mumford compactification. So what, what one do is to try to embed this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this Riemann surface into a projective spaces and take uh, limits there. But if you just arbitrarily embed, then the limits are not unique. You can get uh, as, as bad singularities as you like. And this, uh, this compactification, they pick out this uh, called stable curves. So what this says is that uh, you do not uh, allow a degenerator arbitrarily. You on, only so if this uh, curve. So here, you, in algebraic geometry, you view this uh, Riemann surface as a algebraic curve, and uh, the only way you allow them to degenerate is when two points uh, come together in a generic way, and uh, in the end, you form a nodal singularity. It's a node. And this, this Deline Mumford commodification is, uh, is a commodification of the moduli space of highly genus Riemann surface by adding these nodal curves. And actually, these two are compatible in the sense that uh, these limits can be think of as the complete hyperbolic metric on the complement of these uh, nodal curves. So you, if you remove the nodes, this becomes non-compact, and they all meet a complete matrix with constant curvature minus 1. And these are exactly the same. And actually, it's known that the, uh, the two compactification actually have the same topology. So this is uh, in the case when lambda is negative, we understand that this uh, basically this 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 side is basically understand it explicitly, and when lambda is uh, zero, this is uh, even more interesting. That we we are only consider flat torus, and. Uh, because we fix the volume. If we fix the volume, in order for a sequence of flat torus to degenerate, the only thing you can get is uh, when they collapse in one direction and uh, go to infinity along another direction. So, so the limit should be, the only limit is uh, the infinite long line, so R. But algebraic geometry. So, so this is not algebraic geometric object. This is a one-dimensional, real one-dimensional limit. But algebraic geometry, there is also not a unique, uh, nice uh, limit uh, you can take. So if you if you if you embed the curves uh, in, in P n, then this stable curve. Stable limit you would like to take is uh, the best thing you, you can think of is this chain of of, of CP ones of lines it's n plus one. This is a, a cycle of n plus one P ones. So as you enlarge n, you get uh, more of more and more of these uh, P ones. So this, this, this is not even well understood in one dimension. How are these, uh, this, this limit is related to this algebraic geometric limit. One would like to think of this, uh, this as a limit of all these, uh, of all these uh, cycle of P1s. But 
it's not clear how good that, that should be. So what I want to talk about is uh, in the higher dimensional case, but uh, in, the, in that simple setting, the lambda is positive. So we're in the final case. So this phenomenon turns out to not happen. And what we get is uh, just like a P1, the limit. This is an algebraic object. So, so, so in higher dimension. If we have a sequence, x i, j i, now i, omega i, the ratio omega i is lambda omega i, and the fixed volume i and b as before. And to prevent this uh, this thing to happen, we add an extra condition that the diameter of this manifold are uniform bounded by a fixed number d. So this condition is automatic when lambda is 1 by the Myers theorem. So, so if we are interested in the case when lambda is positive, then we don't need this condition. The point is that, uh, so for this sequence of uh, metrics, uh, we can take a limit, a gromov house of limit, by passing to a subsequence, x infinity. So the limit is taken, you, you throw out these extra structures, uh, with J, L, omega. You only consider this as a sequence of metric spaces, compact metric spaces with the boundary diameter. What you do is to approximate these uh, metric spaces uniformly by finite set, by a finite metric space. And then you take a limit, and then you, 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 you make this uh, approximation finer and finer. And then you take another limit and take a diagonal limit. So this is a compact metric space. So, so this is uh, the, the limit one can take using this matrix. But it's, it's not as good as in one dimension where, where you can describe explicitly how the metric looks like. And these metrics in higher dimension can form singularities. But the theorem. This is was joint work with Donaldson. <coughs> is that uh, this x infinity is naturally a normal projective variety? So there's a so this x infinity a priori is just a metric space, but there's a natural way to associate a structure of a algebraic variety which is normal to this x infinity, and uh, this implies that if we, if we add uh, the extra condition that uh, the diameter is uniformly bounded, then this set can be compatified by adding these uh, this, this limits, which are also algebraic. Actually, they have more conditions like Q funnel. There's a, there's a way to define a funnel condition for varieties. And uh, they, they have, they have uh, constraints on the possible singularities. So I will talk about more in two-dimensional case. 
So, so this means that uh, can compactify. Modular space. Under this natural, under this condition, diameter bound. And diameter only bounded. So, so as I said, so if if we only consider funnel, yeah. I guess uh, I was. Uh, th this is uh, only the case when when it's a funnel. So if we only consider funnel or manifold, then this this condition is automatic satisfied. When then we are fine. And we, what we don't know much about the, the case when the the variety is not a, is is a negative in the negative and the and the zero case. <coughs> so you the, so so one would expect that the, in, in the case when lambda is negative, if the diameter bound is not satisfied, then the, you can form you can only form this cusp singularities. And in the in the, in the case lambda is equal zero, if uh, if the diameter is bound is not satisfied, then the limit must be, be collapsed. So the proof of this uh, theorem are based on an estimator of the Bergman function. So how would we get this uh, algebraic structure? The idea is uh, to embed this, uh, this, this manifold into projective spaces and take limits. So if, if we have, this is a general setting, if we have a, just, just a polarized Keller manifold, omega 2 pi C1L, then one can one can embed x into projective space using the sections of uh, homomorphic sections of the line bundle powers of l but with this metric one can take the there's a l2 metric on space of sections. If you, if you take a if you take section, you can consider it's a L2 norm to be the pointwise L2 norm measured by the Hermitian metric corresponding to omega, and then integrate against the omega to n, n factorial. So then one can try to embed a, there you can you can you can define map from x to p some some number this is the dimension of this space so nk is the dimension of this vector space using also normal basis of x l k This, this map is well defined for k large. This Kodaira embedding theorem. But the point is that if you use also normal basis, then this this map is well defined up to a unitary group transformation. <coughs> and that means uh, it makes sense if we can embed all these xi's in project space. Then it makes sense to talk about the limits of the image because. Uh, it's well defined up to a compact group, actually. <coughs> so, but the point is that uh, a priori for a fixed x, uh, we can always find a k large so that this is well defined, and that there's a quantitative way of define of measuring this uh, by defining the Bergman function. So this is a rule k. This is a function on x, which is defined to be 
the supremum of uh, you take all the holomorphic sections uh, of uh, L to the k with uh, norm 1. And you measure this uh, at uh, x. So the, that this is well defined is equivalent to that this is positive everywhere. But a more precise uh, fact is that uh, for fixed x and omega, this has an expansion as k grows. So this there's an expansion, this is a this is zero DC expansion. Rho k grows like k to the n plus two k to the n minus one. This is a smooth asymptotic expansion. So if if we fix uh, x and omega, then then this will be positive when k is large. And moreover, not not only this map is well defined, but the this function rho k actually mirrors the relation between the forbidden Stoney metric and the metric you start with. So rho k star of forbidden Stoney differs from, because this is a, in the cohomology class of, this is a curvature of L to the k, so this, uh, you need to scale omega by k. This is IDD bar log rho k. So given the expansion, it's easy to see that when k is uh, very large, these are very close. So as k goes to infinity, this, if you normalize this by k, then it converges to original omega. So, so intuitively, this is just like the, the Weierstrass approximation, given a metric you approximate by polynomial metrics. And uh, but this is for fixed uh, metric. But if you if you if we consider the sequence of metrics, then the, the main problem is that uh, we need to find a uniform estimate of this row case. So the the main theorem is uh, the technical theorem. Is that uh, so, so? So, given this uh, this data, given the lambda, sorry, given n and d, there are constants it's k epsilon positive, depending only on. N and D such that uh, this, this, this is a row K is bounded below by epsilon. For all these uh, elements here with this diameter bound. So actually, this, this, this volume, it, once we have diameter bound and this normalized reach lower bound, then the volume bound is uh, automatic, so we don't need a volume bound here. So the up, I should say, the lower bound is, is more complicated. So this is the key to the proof of, of that theorem. The point that uh, for each fixed i, for each fixed i, we have the embedding of xi into project spaces. 
But now if we have a sequence, we need to we need a uniform estimate on this uh, on this uh, map, embedding map. Sorry, this is not rule K. Call it TK. This is the map from X to to the predictive space. In order to, in order to take, in order to, to relate this uh, Gromov household limit to the, to an algebraic uh, variety, we, we we want to be able to take limits of this uh, embeddings, and this uh, this estimator guarantees that this uh, this, this maps uh, T K, not only are they well defined, but also their gradient is uniform bounded, so one can take limits, and once once we can take limits, then we can we have a relation between this uh, x infinity and the limits of this uh, of this variety in project space so this was uh, called Tian's partial c0 estimate conjecture So this is a, an abstract uh, way of compactifying the moduli space. So we, we have this, uh, we can take all these uh, limits and uh, we, we at least have a compact moduli space of final manifolds. And the algebra geometry, they should correspond to com this constructing moduli space using this case stability. But that's very hard to, to study directly using algebra geometry. So in, in the rest of the talk, I will describe the, the case when dimension is two. Then, then actually, this, uh, this moduli space can be understood very explicitly. So there are not so many of uh, final manifolds, as I said before. In, in dimension two, it's classified as a CP2. CP1 times CP1, CP2, or CP2 blown up at uh, generic at S generic points, where S is uh, from 1 to 8. And these, they, they, you, but you, we want to consider study moduli spaces. These are rigid. So in order to have uh, non-trivial moduli space, this S uh, has to, so we call this a DPS. So this is not a one manifold, it's a, it's, it's it's a, it's a family of a complex manifold. So it's parameterized by this uh, points on P2 moduli equivalence relation. So, so we are only interested in the case when S is uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we denote by M K E S the the space of all the all DPS that admit K Einstein metric. So these are elements in this family that admit K Einstein metric. And uh, we assume this is non-empty. <coughs> so this was a, a theorem of Chen and Yao in the 80s. We only care about these uh, four cases. Actually, I think TM proved that all the smooth ones are meet K-line symmetry, but for our purposes, we don't need that. We only need this. 
And then once it's not empty, then we can just define abstractly this uh, as the Gromov of Hausdorff. Compactification of this space. So what this means is that we take all the possible limits like this. And we form a compact space. And so in two dimensions, it's a it's especially nice due to, due to Anderson, Bandu, Kasue, Nakajima, and Tian in 19, around 1990, is that in two-dimensional case, these x infinities, they are, they are orbifolds. So dimension two, the x infinity, uh, because we are considered the final case, so they are pairs of orbifolds. So just a two-dimensional orbifold with a positive anti-canonical line bound. As because uh, we are taking limits, so they are Keller Einstein. So locally, so locally, the the complex structure looks like C two modular gamma, where gamma is a finite subgroup of U two acting freely on the three sphere. <coughs> so we have this space. And uh, this is a theorem. Joint work with uh, Odaka, Scotty. Is that uh, for any such as uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, there exists uh, an explicitly constructed uh, called algebraic uh, geometric moduli space. There's a moduli space. So I use quote because in algebra geometry, this uh, moduli space actually means uh, more things. But we, I will explain more about what this means uh, for our purpose. So M S algebraic and a natural homeomorphism. This is F S from M S K E bar to M S algebraic. So in rough words, we, what we know is uh, we know actually what are the equations for the for the orbifolds in this uh, in this uh, moduli space. So. So this moduli space. M L L G S means that we have a space, so it's a compact house of space, and each point corresponds to a unique isomorphism classes of uh, of some del Petro orbifold, and there's no repetition in this space, and then we're done. So so I, I will first. Uh, Describe this space uh, just to give a feeling what this look like, and uh, then I will just uh, say one word about the proof of this. So, so when S is six, uh, if, if we have CP two blow up six points, if it, if the six points are gener general, then these are all cubic surfaces. Uh, Namely, they are defined by a cubic polynomial, homogeneous polynomial, x1, x2, x3, x4, 0, inside CP4, CP3.
This, this, is, the, this is the classification of smooth dipedal surfaces. So, so this, uh, this, uh, this uh, algebraic module space is actually, we take all these uh, cubic, cubic polynomials, so that's uh, in what? Symmetric three of C4. So homogeneous cubic polynomial in four variables, and we take projectivization. This is uh, the space of all cubic uh, equations in four variables. <coughs> but that's a repetition here, because we can do linear change of coordinate. So we quotient by this action of PGL 4C. And, uh, and this quotient, in general, does not make sense, because this is a non-compact group. The quotient is, could be non hostile We want hostile space, so we take the semi-stable parts, and uh, this quotient uh, means that uh, we take the stable, this in the GIT sense, we take the, 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 the open stable part, take the quotient, and uh, they take the semi-stable part and they contract in this uh, semi-stable locus to the polystable locus. But the, what really may, means that uh, th this is space, is it, it's a well-defined compact uh, cost of space, and each one of them, each point in this space actually corresponds to one of these uh, cubic surfaces. It could be singular. And uh, this was, uh, so this stability of this uh, object was studied in Hilbert's thesis. Is that uh, this stable, so uh, F cube is stable if and only if, so this has a nice uh, characterization. This, this uh, let's say, this XF, this, this uh, has at the worst. A1 singularities. So the A1 singularity means uh, the local is just a quotient of C2 modulo Z2. Z2 acts uh, in the obvious way. Or it is uh, the surface defined by the equation at x1, x2, x3 minus x4 to the cube is zero. This one has three A2 singularities. It's a bit complicated. But this has a nice description as a quotient of P2 by a Z3 action. So that this, this is a, the third root of unity acts on P2 by multiplication by one zeta zeta square. And obviously, this has a K line symmetric. So what this theorem says is that. Uh, if we consider, so S equals 6, then we know this space is exactly this space. And uh, so this is a nice thing. So I should say that uh, in, for, for all these uh, S, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, it's all. All the smooth ones are parameterized by things here. So in particular, this recovers the theorem of Tian that every smooth diapetal surface in this family admits a K-line symmetric. And moreover, so Tian's proof was a case-by-case -case study of the alpha invariant. It does not generalize to the case of orbifolds. There are so even for cubic surfaces, there were, there were many efforts trying to I mean, give a specific cubic surface, try to, try to show whether it's K-Einstein or not. That's very complicated. So it's only known in some special cases. But here, this, what, what, what we want to emphasize is that uh, sometimes uh, when we study this uh, existing problem, it's uh, better to take all the family and prove the existence uh, for all of them rather than just for a single one of them. And uh, the last is the proof. 
So we, we have a similar construction when s is uh, 5, 7, 8. It, it gets more and more complicated when, 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 when s is, uh, gets bigger, because the dimensions get bigger. But uh, the proof is uh, we, we, we have this uh, MSKE bar, this abstract object. We don't know. And we want to construct uh, uh, algebraic uh, S. And we know this space is not empty. There are at least one point here. And we want to define this map. So the, the main point is to construct this. And so the, the point is to, to construct uh, MS, FS, sorry. S. So that uh, FS is well defined. This is a compact host of. So actually, this is the main point. So what's the, how how do we define this map? It's, we take a we take a, this object here that corresponds to the path of before. We just send the the corresponding point here, which corresponds to the same that passed all before. So in particular, we need this space to be not so small, so that it, it includes all the possible limits here. But also, we don't want it to be too big. For example, we, if we don't take quotient, then there's a repetition here. We don't want repetition. This, this is a unique uh, image. And once it's well defined, then we know by the bandu mapuche theorem, this map is uh, injective. And also by implicit functional, this is open. And then it's easy to see this is a homeomorphism. Subjective and a homeomorphism. So, so this is, I feel this map, is, this, this proof is, is relatively elementary. Don't require much technical study other than some conceptual understanding of this algebraic geometric modular space theory. And in higher dimension, one would, not, one would expect uh, not an uh, explicit study too soon for every final manifold. But uh, one would expect that uh, to these uh, spaces, uh, they all have an analytic structure. So we, one would like to cons abstractly just define a modular space, uh, including this x infinity. And in Dao, actually, we believe this space uh, this, this compact modular space is a projective variety in a natural sense, but uh, that remains to be done. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So uh, what does uh, one learn as new results on the existence of Taylor Einstein on, on uh, four proposal surface? Uh, I think you get some new results out of this that, uh, that, that we're not obtaining a lot of different Yes? Yeah, just the, I think uh, to, this is the simplest one. If we, so this, uh, this thing can have at the most uh, four A1 singularities. So if we. I think before it's only known that this this admit k line symmetric if it has one a one singularity. If it has two a one singularities, that's not even known before. So, so on the other hand, uh, you you basically you know because we know the equations for all objects here. You actually know all the the ones that that could be the limits of smoother. The, you know all the. Keller Einstein, the pass of before, that could be the limit of smooth ones. But that could be other components. Any questions? Questions? Well, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.